And we're recording. Welcome to your penultimate class session, uh, with next week being the final. Uh, today we're going to talk about quality control and revisit vetting. Um, we may not take the full two hours, and so um, if there are things that are outstanding on your list related to the homework or other things we've covered, maybe Emily, since you missed the last session, we'd be happy to um, address any of those concerns uh, in this session. Before I hand things over to Mike for an overview, are there any questions or concerns you would like to raise? Okay, so to give you a quick preview, Mike's gonna start with an overview about how what we've been talking about, quality control and vetting, is, fits into books and the well-formed document workflow. Then we will take some time to go over uh, homework. And the green dots, I'm delighted to hear that many of you got the green dots, and if you didn't, we can explore why. And then we'll talk about vetting We'll talk about quality control and share the scribe workflow um, as one way for how quality control can be done. And we will also get um, into Sublime, which is a totally optional tool. We're just going to touch on it. We're not going to go deep into Sublime. Um, and we'll also talk about why we're touching on things and why we're going in deep into other things. As always, please know that if we touch on something and you're like, hmm, I would like more of this so that we can be totally self-sufficient and run our show, we're happy to um, support you in uh, going deeper, for example, with Sublime. So without further ado, and since I didn't see any questions, I'm gonna hand things over to Mike. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, so last week, uh, we did a very deep dive into uh, composition, how to identify the uh, elements of your job, and how to actually apply uh, SCML, the scribe uh, markup language, to those documents. And I just want to, uh, as we're, we've sort of gone very specific, and now as we're going back more expansive, uh, I just wanted to tie those together that to make a book you know, it's sort of like it takes a village. It takes a lot of experts to make a book and they all need to be taught speaking the same language. And that's what, uh, that's what the well-formed document workflow is all about. Making sure that everyone can speak the same language while they're making, uh, while they're making their book. So that's the reason why so much emphasis is placed on composing things properly, identifying those elements, and uh, putting them in a format that everyone along the way is going to be able to understand, um, because it helps to sync up all those different bits of expertise, the copy editors, the typeset designers, the typesetters, the ebook people, the indexers. Um, and uh, if every one of those experts knows that they're going to be dealing with a specific markup language, that they're going to be receiving things in a specific format, they can optimize their own uh, work processes to uh, be most efficient to work with SCML or whichever um, language you're speaking. But I'm a little biased. I think SCML is the best one. Um, the reason that uh, we set up this training course to focus most heavily and get most technical when about composition is because, like I said, composition is sort of the linchpin that holds everything together. Um, we're not going deep into typesetting or in making ebooks or how to use InDesign or how to design your books uh, because, again, this is an orientation. There's only so much we could f information we could fit, and the most important thing to fit to ev for everyone to understand is the role of composition, the role of structure in uh, identifying how that book hangs together and communicating it to everybody on the team. So uh, I just wanted to draw that parallel between why we were getting so very, very technical last week. And when we're going to go over your homework in a couple of minutes, we're going to be going over the very technical nitty gritty. And 
that's because those that's that's the linchpin that holds everything else together. So um, I think now uh, Karen is going to break us up to go over the homework. That's true. And I'm just going to add to what Mike said uh, related to typesetting and InDesign. We did touch on that more in the first cohort training. So if you'd like more information, I can point you to the videos related to those topics. But in assessing the experience of the first cohort and thinking about um, experimenting for your experience in the second cohort, we decided um, not to dive deeply into typesetting and design because those are probably commonly um, things that you would either ask scribe to do or ask a freelancer to do. They're not the linchpin of bookmaking, as um, Mike said. Uh, but again, if you really want to know about uh, typesetting and that process or um, in design and design, um, let us know. I will also add that even instructing someone on how to use InDesign, for example, is instruction related to a tool, but it's very different than instruction related to good design, hierarchy, color, white space, all of kind of the things that you need to actually make a good design. Um, in a previous professional role, I worked in uh, a design communication arts program for continuing studies. And one of the things um, we talked about a lot in advising students was the difference between learning how to use the Adobe Creative Suite and the difference between knowing how to use a tool and having appropriate design training around color, typography, and, and all of those things. So um, just to draw a distinction also between knowing how to use a tool and actually using it well. So uh, with that, I'm going to break us up into the breakout rooms. And I'm going to stop recording for that portion. Uh, we think probably around 10 minutes to review the homework and talk about um, the green dot. So it looks like everyone's ready to go. I'm going to start the rooms. We're back from our breakout rooms and reviewing homework and I have resumed recording the session. And so now we're going to move into quality control and vetting and I'm going to turn things over to Mike. Um, well, before uh, I move into vetting, I just wanted to mention something that came up in our breakout room to, for the folks in the other breakout room um, that uh, uh, when Emily was working on catching up with the homework because she wasn't uh, able to make it last week, uh, she had been looked at another document um, to see how the styles were set up there uh, and sort of used that as a model and was concerned that that was not as uh, a full composition. But uh, what I mentioned is that that can actually be a very good and useful way to uh, to work, uh, particularly if you're handling multiple titles, like if you have a full publishing program, you might set up um, word sample files of this is how things are composed for people to look off of. And even if it's a single uh, textbook, you might set up a sample chapter that people can look off of um, and use that as a model. So uh, that was uh, just something I wanted to share with the folks who were in the other breakout room. Uh, that that can be a very good and efficient way to work. Uh, I didn't know if the other room had anything they wanted to share with us. I think we were we were good. Everybody had a green dot, so uh, and I think we had gone through uh, some of the stuff. But what we did share um, was the fact that as you're using the hub, if you run into any issues or if you um, have any any problems uploading like large files or there's something in the file that just doesn't. Uh, seem to play well with the hub, you can always contact us. Um, and because we're admins, we'll be able to help you out um, with with that and be able to see the errors and sort of work that out with you. So uh, whenever you're using the hub, you're also getting our support. Um, so, you know, never feel like you're going in and it's like, oh, well, this didn't work. And so it didn't work. So, yeah. Great. Great. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, vetting and quality control and why um, why we um, talk about them as related to one another, even though they take place at very different times in the production process. Uh, for instance, we have initially, initially mentioned vetting and it was in the textbook uh, 
so long ago there was snow on the ground. Um, and we only really touched on it very briefly, uh, saying that we would come back to it because vetting is the essential function of assessing what state the project is in, what services the project's going to need, uh, and then deciding on how those services are going to get done. So um, the uh, vetting checklists, we're not going to go through all the vetting checklists. Um, oh, thanks, Karen. So yes, there's Karen just put a link in the chat. Um, we have links to the to the vetting checklists. They're all very specific impl implementations of those questions of what's in this project, uh, what needs to be done to this project, who's going to do it, um, and on what uh, schedule are they going to do it. And also, uh, depending on how much of your work you're doing in-house, um, you might have to decide exactly how they're going to go about doing it. Um, obviously, if you're employing Scribe or if you're employing a freelancer, uh, you're going to have less control over their methodology. Um, but the... Uh, I've lost my outline. Um, the basic questions of um, what's here, what does it need, uh, those form the basis of vetting. Uh, so you can define, you can know beforehand essentially what you're getting into. Uh, and the reason we have so many <clears throat> uh, specific task specific um, vetting lists is because a copy editor is going to need to know different things about the state of a book than a typesetter is going to need to know. And that's why we're not going to go through every single vetting checklist. Uh, but I am showing you yes. all of the vetting checklists yeah. um, yes. to illustrate what Mike is saying. Um, there's the composition vet, copy editing, proofreading, design and typesetting, extraction, images, indexing, and ebook. <laughs> yes for all of your vetting needs. Um, and you can see why we're not going to go step-by-step step through each of these lists with you um, because it would cause everybody pain. Right. Uh, and uh, as Elvis mentioned in the chat, we suggest uh, vetting as thoroughly as possible, as early as possible, uh, because that enables you to know <clears throat> what you're in for uh, as early as, as you can. So you can make preparations to address it. You can uh, see what sort of uh, expertise is going to be needed. Are you going to need an actual subject matter expert uh, to help with the copy editing? Um, are you going to need to uh, secure uh, permissions to release all these images under CC BY? Are you going to... Uh, need to commission an artist to, or, or a graphic designer to generate tables that are legible to students. Um, all these questions are what you're going to answer during vetting. And um, any questions on that before I jump to quality control? Quality control is what happens at the end of not just the entire process, but also each piece of the process in, uh, ideally, yes, it should happen at the end of each task. Um, quality control is not a process by which we find errors in the file. Quality control is a process that we check that all the proper procedures were followed. Um, the difference there is that 
um, if the proper procedures were followed, then all errors should have already been caught by those procedures. It's, it sounds a little bit like splitting hairs, um, but it really isn't uh, because as we saw last week, um, getting into the, um, getting into the details and the very technical aspects of any one of these tasks, like we got into composition last week, very down dirty looking at every paragraph and seeing what it does. Human beings have a tendency towards tunnel vision to seeing what they're focused on and not necessarily how it is tied in to the project as a whole. Um, and that's important. You need to uh, review every paragraph in a book and decide what job it's doing. You need to compose the entire book. Um, so getting that tunnel vision while you're working on the project is not uh, necessarily a bad thing. It's just something that you need to be aware of so that someone can take a different look at it from a different perspective. And that is the quality control person to make sure that um, all the big questions are answered, that everything fits together the way it's supposed to, that all the services that vetting uh, flagged as necessary for this project are actually getting done um, and are getting done in a way that's going to get the project to where it needs to be. Uh, one of the rules that we have at Scribe is that quality control can never be done by the, the person who actually did that particular type of work on that project. So whoever composed the job cannot QC their own work. Whoever typeset the job cannot QC the typeset of this of that project um, because you need that different perspective. You need uh, that someone who's focused only on the big picture, the bigger picture at this point at the quality control stage. Um, right, so that's how quality control, which is what takes place at the end. And we have a bunch of quality control checklists, which I'll put a link to here. And those checklists are, if anything, more detailed than the vetting checklists, um, which is one of the reasons why we're not going to go over them item by item, because um, I don't want to see everyone's eyes glaze over. Um, but I think I may have mentioned this in a previous session, most of the items on those QC checklists have resulted because of an error someone at Scribe made. Uh, that we wanted to make sure we did not repeat. Uh, and so we've added an element to the QC checklist to check for it. So by looking at our QC checklists, you gain, um, you gain the knowledge of all the mistakes that we have made. We're sharing that with you. Um, so that you can go out and make new and different mistakes on your own, which is what we do uh, more often than we would like. So um, one of the other elements about quality control I wanted to touch on is that it is best done by um, an expert in the particular task, someone who's done that particular task. You wouldn't want to give uh, a typesetting QC uh, to someone who's never typeset before. Uh, so at Scribe, we have one person who QCs most of our composition, another person who QCs all of our typesets, a team that QCs our copy edits, um, 
And so again, if you send any, outsource any of these tasks to us, uh, that's the procedure that'll be going on behind the scenes. Uh, occasionally I have people, uh, clients ask me like, you know, where is this file? And I can tell them, well, the work is done, but it's still in quality control. Um, and you'll get it when that's complete. Uh, so that's what's going on behind the scenes if you send it to Scribe. Um, now, uh, Elvis is gonna talk just for a couple minutes about an example of folks who do their own QC. Right, thanks Mike. So when we worked with uh, Kathy at UConn, they are really like hands-on. They wanna like take care of everything. And so what they did is that they first talked to us and they sort of gained the expertise, not only from the classes, but through, um, you know, just communication with us. They would send us their files, uh, like Karen Bjork did as well. They would send us their files um, and we would give them feedback. And then based on that feedback, they essentially cultivated, you know, an expertise within their, um, within their team. So then that way they would have the ability to check each other's work without always having to send it to us, right? And so what we would want um, to do whenever like we're trying to cultivate that expertise is use those QC checklists that um, Mike mentioned because those, as Mike already said, already sort of deal with common errors that we've already sort of all of us here have committed at one point or another, right? And so the, the point of, of all of this is that you have not only, as Mike said, a different set of eyes uh, to look at it, but to make sure that as little as possible, because we are human, we, things will slip by us. But if we can have as little as possible actually, um, you know, slip by us, essentially, um, we have to make sure that we have not only the person who did the work check the work themselves because um i don't know if you guys saw it on the chat um i mentioned that you should always um think of qc not as hey they're going to catch it it's going to be fine uh i can leave this in here it's rather i'm going to make sure that this is perfect before it leaves my hands and whatever the qc people catch is what i just couldn't know because you know they've had more experience or something that they saw because i've already you know, grown accustomed to this manuscript. Um, and so to return to that example uh, from Kathy, they, you know, cultivated the expertise first and now they're checking their own work, but they are, they've sort of implemented what we've already uh, talked about now when the same person who composed, let's say this chapter is not the same person who's gonna QC that chapter, just so that they can make sure that every chapter has been thoroughly checked. Um, yeah, and so I think that, that should be enough on that, but if there are any questions, um, I think we can use this time to, to answer it, and if not, I'll just send it back to Mike. All right, so um, I just mentioned in the chat that um, Elvis reminded me that all outstanding questions, as much as possible, should be addressed before you do quality control for anyone does quality control because otherwise the QC or can't check to see if those questions, the answers to those questions were implemented properly. Um, uh, sometimes the, um, um, you're going to have outstanding questions that aren't answered before you have to move it on. And the way to, to implement those is to ensure that the question has been communicated to the person who needs to, to make the decision to, to get an answer. Um, so, the, this week's homework that uh, we just finished talking about was to get the green dot on, the, uh, on your project on the Digital Hub. That is kind of like a tiny little taste of QC. Um, we have, program the hub uh, so that the computer will check that uh, certain rules and procedures were followed. And if they have, they give you the green dot. Um, so it's certainly not a replacement for a human doing a full QC, but it's a complement to it. Um, and uh, that's, I think, all I wanted to say before we get into Sublime, unless anyone has any questions. 
All right. Well, uh, Elvis, I'm going to throw it back to you. Great. So I just want to touch briefly on Sublime. Sublime is a text editor, so sort of like Notepad that comes with um, Windows. Um, and I think, I don't know what the text editor that comes with, um, with Mac OS, but um, it's a little bit more robust. There are certain tools, text edit on, on Mac. Thank you, Karen. Um, so there are, there's a lot of, there's little tools and little things that you can use to customize Sublime, um, to make it do what you want it to do. We here at Scribe use Sublime not only uh, to as almost an XML editor um, to edit our SCML, which again is just a flavor of XML. Um, but we also use it to run certain checks. That's why it connects to our whole, our whole idea of vetting and uh, QC, which we're discussing in this class. So I'm just going to show you just briefly Sublime on my screen here. So it looks nice and colorful. Let me just open up this as well. And so if you're looking at this, this is actually our homework file composed, um, ran through the hub and actually converted to Sam, which is another conversion that the hub can do. Um, and Sam is just our, um, it stands for scribe abbreviated markup. And what that is, is essentially it's an intermediary file for all of our conversions. So everything goes through Sam before it goes to, uh, you know, back to Word if you're going from like InDesign XML to Word or something like that, um, or from, for example, Word to HTML. And so the difference between um, uh, SAM, uh, Scribe Abbreviated Markup, and SCML, which is um, um, the Scribe Markup language, is just that it's, it's not as uh, defined. There are specific differences, which we won't get into now, just because I don't want to get too technical. So this is Sublime, and you can see that already um, it does something different than a regular text editor would do, uh, which, for example, it gives us this syntax um, highlighting, which what that does is that allows us to see uh, certain styles and th certain tags um, highlighted different from regular text. And what we can already know here is that uh, when we looked at permissions acknowledgments in that Word file, and I'll actually open that up here just so that you have that comparison, and where it takes a little bit, and it also opens in a different window. So. Look at this. When you look at um, a Word file, a composed Word file, which is what we've been doing up until now, you see that this CTFM um, style translates to this CTFM tag here. Um, and this is actually what you're doing when you're composing. You're taking a file that essentially is just text and you're applying this tagging just in Word. And so when we convert it in the hub to SAM, um, the hub actually creates this file for you um, and we'll go through um, and make these uh, tags uh, in that file, right? So um, if any of you have worked with XML, then this should seem a little bit familiar or even HTML um, in the sense, for example, in HTML, you have P tags for the body tags. We have P tags for the body tags as well, as you can see here. And so what Sublime lets you do, it allows you to um, not only check this file um, using certain checks that are available. Again, we won't get too deep into those uh, simply because uh, this is something optional. This is not something that you have to do. But you will notice something about the composition QC list. And I'll show you, or any of the QC lists, actually. Once you go through this QC list and you see that there are little, um, there's actually little check boxes here that you can use to mark off the stuff that you've already checked. Um, but you go through this checklist, once you get to the end, after you've gone through all of this that's sort of checking your Word file, you'll get down to these things called text checks. And what these are, these are regular expressions. I'm not sure how many, how many of us here have experience with regular expression. We won't be getting into teaching you how to make those, uh, but there are plenty of resources online uh, in order to teach you, that teach you how to uh, make regular expressions. And regular expressions are just a search string that allows you to search for certain things beyond just typing in the text and searching for that specific text. Um, and so each of these symbols here um, on the screen here mean uh, something, right? But we're not gonna delve too deep into that. But what you can do 
if you are so inclined to check your own compose file, um, you don't need to understand regular expressions to see um, what these do because they'll have this little description that'll say have all email addresses been wrapped in URL tags. And you can click this button, this little um, copy to clipboard button. If you click on that and then you go back into Sublime, and control F, the same shortcut that works in Word works in Sublime as well. Uh, that'll bring up um, the search uh, function in Sublime and that appears down here. You can actually just paste that. I'm just hitting control B here. Uh, and as long as you have regular expressions on in Sublime, it'll actually show you if this is actual, if what you're searching for is present in your file. And that's enough to give you a good idea of whether you need to fix something or not. So for example, here URLs aren't present in this file aside from the uh, opening, um, ta uh, opening tags up uh, at the top of the file, so it's not gonna find these. And you can see that there's an entire list of uh, quality control regular expressions for you to use uh, to look for spacing errors. So for example, spaces on the other side of high on, uh, opposite sides of uh, hyphens, uh, things like double punctuation and things like that. And so uh, each one has its own little descriptor at the top. So that could be, serve as a good introduction into regular expressions. Uh, the other thing that Sublime, as I mentioned before, uh, it let, that it lets you do is that it allows you to um, add what are called packages. And again, that's, um, it's very technical, but we have a tutorial on our site to add uh, scribe packages that allow you to, for example, take text. Let's say you need to edit this and this needs to be title case. Let me actually move this little bar over here. And you can actually change it to, for example, title case, and it will do that automatically uh, for everything that's selected. I'm going to go ahead and undo that just because that's wrong. Um, so uh, essentially, Sublime is a more robust text editor that you can use. Uh, in order to not only check for things, but um, to also um, make certain edits to the SAM if you so need to, or make certain uh, changes to an SCML file. Or for example, if you open up an HTML file in Sublime, it will also give you all the syntax highlighting and you can use that to, for example, edit an ebook uh, that you've unzipped. Again, these are things that are very technical and I'm giving a very brief overview uh, over this so that you can so you can see some of the tools that we use and we do mention sublime a lot in our quality control list and also in our vetting checklist because a, one way that you can check a file would be to actually run it through the hub as it is and open it up in um, in sublime after you've converted it to SAM to see um, what's going on in the file in a view that's different than word um, so that is sublime um, in a nutshell um, I'm Free to ask any uh, feel free to ask any questions. Um, I do see the chat um, glowing, but I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now. Um, oh, no questions, okay. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about Sublime or uh, regular expressions, remember that there are certain things that the orientation isn't going to take care of, but we are always here to sort of help deepen your knowledge if you so need it. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Karen unless there are any questions. I put a link to Sublime in the chat, and then when you guys look at Unit 7 for your homework between this week and next, you'll also see more about Sublime. So we gave you a sort of preview today. Okay, so Mike and Elvis have been talking about the nitty gritty details of vetting and quality control, particularly as they relate to composition, for example. And I would like to briefly touch on uh, another vetting and quality control feature that you will all be doing um, and will develop your own methodology for, and that is checking for license compliance. So um, as many of you know, part of my role at the Open Textbook Network is to manage the Open Textbook Library. And I can tell you uh, in reviewing books for inclusion in the Open Textbook Library, how very, very common it is for an openly licensed textbook to have images that are either not appropriately licensed for that licensed textbook or are not clearly attributed. So it, I don't really know where they came from or if they're openly licensed. And so um, with the expertise of 
the two cohorts and the um, predominantly librarian crew. I know that um, you guys will have the expertise to check that. Um, I have heard time and again from your colleagues that it's very common for there to be misunderstandings between you as the project manager and the faculty author about openly licensed images, what can and can't be used. And so I highly recommend um, a practice I've recommended before, and that is to ask for a first sample chapter or two to, that includes images so that you can see, oh, okay, this person understands, you know, what the license means. Um, in the cooperative, we're using CC by licensed works to enable easier adaptation and editing. And then you can also see, okay, this person is practicing clear attribution practices. It's gonna make it really clear for downstream users where this image came from um, and where they can find it, um, let's say if they need a higher res image. So all of that to say, um, I think that uh, all of you will be able to do that work. We do not have a checklist for that work. Uh, if it turns out that that would be really useful to you, um, let me know. I bet there may be someone out there who's already developed that checklist, but just as a reminder, um, you know, the Scribe team will not be looking for Creative Commons license compliance. I'm not reviewing the books before they go to press, so that is your responsibility, and if you have any questions about it, please let me know. Okay, we're rounding out the hour and probably wrapping up today's session. So um, Elvis and Mike are just gonna talk a little bit again about an example from the first cohort in terms of what's available to you as a scribe consultation. Then we'll review the homework and adjourn unless any of you have questions you'd like for us to spend some time on. Thanks, Karen. So I'll, I'll just take, take point and then hand it over to Mike. Um, so when we worked with Karen Bjork uh, from Portland State, um, they consulted with us and on a sort of like, we were going to be the freelancers, we were going to be the, the vendors to do most of the work, right? Because they've, they wanted to do the composition, but there were a lot of things that, for example, um, that we could do uh, on a quicker timeline or just uh, sometimes rarely, but it happens, um, we're more inexpensive um, than uh, doing it in-house just because um, it involves training and whatnot. So when we first spoke with Karen, Karen came to us and she sent us the files um, and we did um, our vet here. And we sort of came, came, went back to her and said, this is what this book is going to need and this these are the services that we offer. And we'll say, okay, we can do proofreading, we can do copy editing, we can do typesetting, we can design the cover, we can um, you know do everything if you so choose it. We can even compose it for you or you can you know, pick and choose uh, what you would like. And Karen essentially said, okay, this is, um, you know, it's, we're gonna compose it, um, this is gonna get edited. Um, I believe that one did not get a proofread. I think that um, they skipped on that just based on our, um, our discussion. By the way, again, we'll repeat it. If you have to choose between copy editing and proofreading, choose copy editing. It, even though it seems like it'll cost more, it costs less in the end because there's a lot less, um, you know, things to deal with and a lot less people involved. Um, if, um, because if you choose proofreading, for example, um, you'll have to have the typesetter uh, along with the editor uh, involved. And um, yeah, it just gets kind of messy um, at that point. So always choose copy editing if you have to choose between one or the other. If you can do both, that's great. That That is actually ideal. Um, and so when we spoke with Karen, we told her, this is what you have, these are our options. They chose not to go with proofreading, they chose to do the composition, that obviously brought the cost down, um, and it also uh, gave them a good learning opportunity. So what I wanna say with this is that Scribe is flexible, even if you just wanna use this even just for editing, or just typesetting, or just design, um, we are more than happy to help um, in that um, respect. So uh, what ended up happening was, is that while they were composing it, I was a person who was QCing, um, the work. So uh, Karen would send me her, um, you know, her team's work, and I would send back feedback, and we would go back and forth like that for a while until 
uh, the file was officially composed. And even then, once we received the file here, we went through and did another review over it just to make sure that everything was okay, just understanding that um, you know they were learning. Uh, and we actually do that with um, some of our clients here that they choose to compose because they're part of the well-formed document workflow and they choose to compose things on their own. And so what we do here is we review the composition. Um, obviously that cuts down uh, time because we're not doing the full composition of the whole um, manuscript, but it does take some time for us here to go through and check that. Uh, in Karen's example, once we had the files in our hands, uh, then we just took care of everything and just always kept that communication uh, with Karen, letting her know when things were going to be in her hands, when the author would need to review, what the author's responsibilities uh, were. Uh, but it was really a collaborative effort in which we all spoke together and we all sort of came to um, the agreement of what would be best for not only the project but also your institution. So um, I guess that would be like a good summary of what we can do. Uh, we can be flexible, we can do everything, or we can do just do one little piece because you guys want to take it over, um, or you know, we can just consult and say, hey, we're going to handle everything, but we need your expertise to check our composition, for example, or just check our typesetting, make sure it's okay. Um, you know, we're available for that um, as well. So we're flexible in that um, respect. So uh, we're here. It doesn't like it doesn't mean like now when we end in uh, next week, you know, end our orientation, you will never hear from us again. We are always here and always available to help. Um, and I think that sort of has been the the, the theme throughout, uh, and especially in today's class. So remember, you can always reach out to us, reach out to the cooperative, um, because we are also monitoring that and uh, can offer our expertise there. And there's tea time at the first uh, Monday of every month, so you, you know, you'll see our lovely, lovely faces uh, still. So uh, with that, um, I don't know if Mike wants to add anything. Um, I think he, yeah, he's shaking his head. So um, I think I've covered everything. I talked a lot, so I'll, I'll send, send it over to Gary. Okay, so for next week, please prepare by reviewing Unit 7, the final unit in our curriculum. We did cover much of it today, so hopefully repeated exposure will um, benefit you. And uh, as we did at the beginning of the course, if you'd like to bring two questions related specifically to your projects or to what you read about in the unit or what you know about so far, please do. Um, Next week, we're going to talk about packing up files and we're going to wrap up the orientation. So any lingering fears, doubts, questions, celebrations, uh, they are all welcome. Uh, we will also be talking about accessibility, which is something covered in the first unit because it's important to plan for accessibility early on. And we're going to revisit it with an expert from Scribe. Elvis, is John confirmed? Yes, John is confirmed. Super. So John, who handles uh, EPUB production and accessibility at Scribe, will come and give a very short talk about it. Um, and then your questions will be welcome, any concerns you may have, or questions about how you or the author can set up the document for greatest accessibility, uh, especially related to alt tags for images, things like that. Um, John will be a great resource for you. Um, that is it, unless anyone has any questions. Okay, I'm also going to prepare a final evaluation so that you can share your feedback for us. We had unit evaluations, um, which were helpful, and I also invite and encourage you to please share your feedback for us about Unit 7, since it'll be fresh. Um, but then we're also going to ask for your feedback about this experience that we've been having together since January. So your um, critique and your encouragement is also appreciated in terms of what we have been doing well, what we can do better for next time. And that I believe is it. So I will say farewell. It's nice to see all of you and uh, hope you have a good week until we meet again. Okay, bye. Thank you.